Hey, what's going on guys? It's Michael from the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that uses biblical discernment to help all believers in all aspects of life. Today, we're going to be doing that by looking at a sermon given by Andy Stanley. Typically, I try to watch these sermons three times through so that I don't miss anything. This sermon, however, was just recently sent to me and I have not had time to get through any of it. So we are going to be watching this freshly together for the first time, except of course, the clip that I made, uh, that I made a meme out of. So there will be that. Now, that being said, there may be some things I miss. I'd be interested to see as we listen through here, if there's something that you think I missed that you picked up, leave it in the comment section below. Or as always with these sermon reviews, if you think I'm being overly critical, underly critical, let me know. The conversation I think helps make uh, these better and it helps me do this better. So with that being said, don't want to keep you too long. If you want to watch the whole sermon without my commentary, as always, link in the description below. So we're in part uh, three of a brand new series that we creatively named Brand New. How about that? And if you missed the, the first two parts, you need to go back and watch them. You're sort of coming in on the in the middle of a five-part movie, okay? So part, we're right in the middle, and we're going to pick up where we left off last week. But if you go to brandnewseries.org, you can see the first two. You can see all of these. They'll be up there as long as you have electricity and there's an internet. If you are in a small group, you you can download a PDF and actually just, we have some, dis some discussion questions we've created for you. You can discuss this content in your small group. I'd love for you to wrestle with it as we move through it because some of this is just a little bit different. So one thing that I think he's starting off here, he's trying to pack two sermons worth into one here, which is helpful. This is good because he's trying to catch people up on where he's been so that by the time if you're just walking in like we are, to this sermon series and to this sermon in particular, we're not totally lost. So what we're trying to do in this series is to kind of tease out and to separate out the movement that Jesus began and what we refer to as the temple model. Now, when I say temple model, I'm not specifically talking about the Jewish temple, although it includes that. The temple model is essentially a template for religion that goes all the way back further than the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, certainly the Jews, um, the mud hut religion, um, regions of the world today where you find witch doctors and in other areas of the world where there is still this template in place. The temple model looks like this. There are always sacred places. There are always sacred texts, oracles, inscriptions, documents, you know, religious texts. Sacred men. It's always men, isn't it? Along with sincere followers, or in some cases, you might say superstitious followers, or scared followers, or scarred followers. But there's always a group of people that are dependent. Okay, so what he, he did answer, which is good. Uh, so I want to address that, what temple model meant. Um, so basically, what he's setting up then is this idea that every religion in every place, everywhere, throughout all time, has certain aspects to it that are similar to one another, which is interesting if you look into it. Um, there have been plenty of books written about it. I'm not sure the book that I'm even thinking of now because I'm not sure if Matt told me, but Matt, uh, one of the co-admins over at Instagram on our uh, on our IG page, is going through a book where it's looking at temple models as far as the Jewish temple model relating to past temple models all the way back to it being based upon like the Garden of Eden. Anyway, it sounds super interesting. I am not intelligent enough or even informed enough to, to talk it out here in this video. But my point being connecting to that is that Andy's right in regards to everyone, every religion has a structure. The, the bigger thing here is if you're setting this up then, how are we gonna distinguish Christianity from the these other religions that have similar, um, similar features to them, right? Because if we're believers, what we're essentially saying, and I, and I know a lot of people don't like to word it this way, but what we're essentially saying, Christ is supreme overall. So um, his teachings are supreme overall, and therefore all other religions and all other teachings are not uh, correct or, or right. Uh, Christ's teachings are. So then how do you sort of parse that out a little bit? So it'll be interesting to see how he does that. Also, what's more interesting to me is what text is he going to base this on in order to teach his people? Uh, or are we going to have a text at all? That'll be interesting to see what he does there as well. He established a new covenant, a new arrangement between God and man. 
He established, he gave a new command. He said, every temple system has lots and lots and lots of laws. I wanna give you one command. And this one command is to be the filter through which you view all other commands. This one command is gonna serve for you as an ethic through which you make all your decisions. When you aren't sure what to do, you ask, what does love require of you? When you aren't sure what to do, you stop and pause and you ask the question, what does love require of you? So real quick, I do want to, I, what he's getting at here is John chapter 13, verse 31 through 35. So let's read that real quick because I don't know, maybe he'll get to it. And if he does, great. If he doesn't, at least we've read it because I want to make sure that we don't use Andy's version of what Jesus said. We actually use what the scripture said. So Hopefully he'll reference some scripture, and if it's not this scripture, then I will be corrected. But if not, this is seems to be what he's talking about with the new commandment that Jesus gives. So, that being said, uh, let's let's hop back in. And the apostle Paul became a convert to Christianity, a spokesperson for Christianity, and he more than anyone under else understood this: that you dare not mix the old with the new. Now, without um, giving some sort of scriptural backing here, that doesn't seem to be... I mean, Paul speaks often about Jesus being the fulfillment of all of these things. So this is an odd comment from Andy. And what's so fascinating is that the, the church got off to an extraordinary, an extraordinary start. One of the things I love to do, because I'm so such a geek about this, is I love to read the ancient literature of what pagans said about the Christians. I mean, he's right. There, there's documentation to demonstrate that the Christians were incredibly generous. They saved abandoned children. Um, like all of what he said as far as generosity and caring for one another and saving abandoned children and like that drawing attention. Um, is is correct. We have literature for that. So after Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the Apostle Paul's letters begin to circulate through the churches, but they only had copies. They only had this one and that one. There was no literature. There was no canon. There was just an extraordinary faith that was fueled by love one another. And then something else extraordinary happened. On October the 28th in the year 312, Emperor Constantine was on his way to do battle with his co-emperor Maxentius to find out who would be the supreme ruler of the Roman Empire. He went to battle and he was victorious and the Christians hailed him as a conqueror and suddenly his faith expanded and suddenly he began to consider the one true God of the Christians and suddenly the Christians began to gain status in the kingdom. So we are using it in a really broad brush here in church history. Now, obviously, I don't have time to dissect that here, um, but there are a couple of channels or books that I would highly suggest. I will link those in the description below. The problem was suddenly, suddenly, Christianity became inseparable from empire. And the church leaders created their own version of the temple model with a little bit of Christianity sprinkled in. And now they would determine what was taught, what wasn't taught, and how the text would be interpreted. Perhaps something you heard about in school that's known as the Arian controversy. This was a theological controversy. The only reason I'm gonna tell you about it is because of where it leads that we'll get to in just a minute. And Athanasius, who, who argued persuasively that Jesus was born divine, won the debate. But after the debate, people didn't go away friends and say, well, you believe what you wanna believe and I'll believe what I wanna believe. Suddenly, this was a political issue. This was a financial issue. This was a big issue. No, 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 no. Wait, this is not a political issue or a financial issue. This is a, the a core theological issue. Um, Marcy from uh, Provoke to Proclaim has a, a lot of posts on her Instagram account that kind of works through a lot of these heresies and why understanding the heresy matters because it affects theology. There, there's enough truth in what he's saying here historically that um, you can skim by. But some of these finer points that he's making is absolutely incorrect. And now... Theological division was heresy that was punishable by death. Suddenly believing the wrong thing was a crime. And suddenly in Christianity, what? I, okay, look, oh my goodness. Guys, I'm not saying you should straight up merc somebody over uh, being a heretic, okay? I get it. Like, not probably the best move based upon a changed heart and mind in Jesus. But to say that, 
heresy's not a big deal. I mean, that's what he's basically saying. That that these aren't theological matters, they're political and economic ones, and you can't just like why why don't you let's just like let the heretic believe what the heretic believes and keep teaching it is basically what he's saying here. You had the church version, the Christian version of the temple model. Sacred men, sacred men, this new, this new group of sacred men now became the gatekeepers of heaven and hell through withholding communion, through withholding baptism. With the Look guys, I don't like interrupting every five seconds. The fact that Andy's able to say this demonstrates that we don't understand historical baptism or historical communion or just church history in general. And then in the 11th century, as you know, the first successful crusade was launched. And Pope Urban II. I, 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 will, I will legitimately try not to break in every two minutes, I promise you. But we, you have to understand, we just jumped from the, the 3rd and 4th century to the 12th. We just, we're just not going to talk about all of that. So this is where it is very important to, I, what Andy's doing here is acknowledging where theology and um, where, where men twist theology for their own means. And so here he's right. But again, Ryan Reeves, I would highly suggest Ryan Reeves YouTube channel. He covers a lot of this and demonstrates how um, things like the crusade and things like the twisting of scripture for, for one's own gain happens. Um, and demonstrates it by actual history, not just being like, hey, there was a crusade and it was terrible. Like actually telling you the things that led up to these sorts of things. The temple model was bad. It was just the Christian version. Sacred places, sacred men who controlled the sacred text because no one had access to the Bible. It would be interpreted the way they thought it should be interpreted. And all of a sudden, this, this movement that was to be fueled by love for one another, to be fueled by one anothering one another, almost came to a screeching halt. The next big date in, this, in our story is the year 1517, which marked the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther and others, they weren't trying to abandon the church. They just wanted to reform the church, thus the word Reformation. But those inside the church felt like they were protesting, thus the word Protestant. The reformers were armed with the scriptures and they did exactly what the church had done before. And consequently, the Re Reformation splintered into three, six, a dozen, dozens, and now there are over a thousand Protestant denominations all over the world. And do you know what divided them? Because some loved uh, better than others, because some loved differently than others, no. It was their interpretation of a text because now you had more sacred places with sacred men was saying Protestants have been beating people over the head with the Bible ever since. And the tragedy of all of this, even though if we had lived in those times, no doubt we would have been caught up in the same ways of thinking, in the same conflict, in the same division. At the end of the day, the tragedy was that love lost. Love lost. And we simply ended up with two or three or a half a dozen different versions of the temple model with Jesus sprinkled in. Andy is talking about how the temple model has just been recreated over and over again with sa sacred men and sacred texts and sacred places. So the sacred books that he's talking about that are recreated, recreated in the temple model are necessary. And the early church knew that, which is why they collected them. The sacred men that he's talking about leading these uh, this temple model are the ones that we see set up. Even we have um, the apostles in Jerusalem at the councils. They're, they're there leading for a reason, right? So as to make sure this doesn't go off the rails. Later on down the road, we have the councils of these sacred men that are wrestling through to make sure that this teaching doesn't get distorted and that we understand correctly who the who Jesus is so that the personal work of Jesus don't get distorted and twisted and lead into some incorrect teaching that, that, that doesn't coincide with scripture. So how does that happen? How could something so clear become so complicated? How could the new movement of Jesus with a new command and a new ethic of love that was to serve as the filter for all of their decisions, 
How could something so pure, so grassroots, so one another oriented become so temple? And the reason is, is because there is a little temple model in all of us. And our consciences have been shaped by it. What you fear, what you see as sin, what you think God condemns has been taught to you in such a way and to me in such a way that our conscience have been shaped by it. And consequently, we continue to hold on to things that hold us back and hold the church back. Imagine a world where every single believer in Jesus Christ got up every single day and recognized God is fine with me. Now I must figure out how to be fine with other people. God is fine with me because of Jesus. And I want other people to know Jesus so they can be right with God too. Not I am right with Jesus or I am right with God and I have to find a way to be right with other people. Oh, this, this is like progressive Christianity light right here. I mean, it is like there's progressive Christians that are just like flaunting it out there. Like we don't need the scripture. It's, un it's not necessary. Your hell is right here on earth. Um, you know, <laughs> like they're just blatant things like that. He's not, he, he's not outright saying any of that, but he's definitely, a, he, he definitely seems to be alluding to that. Like, I thought my clip that I, I made a meme out of was bad. Mm, no. no, there's a lot worse here. My whole reason of doing the sermon review was to look at that clip in context, the clip I used for the meme, to make sure that I, you know, wasn't taking him out of context. And all I, all I got from this was that that wasn't the worst part of the sermon there were way more concerning parts of this sermon. So anyway, let me know what you think and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you next week. See ya.